sort of started thinking about um, market design, you know, uh, 25 or 30 years ago, um, I started really trying to understand not just uh, how the rules of the, pri the pricing rules and the auction rules sort of affect behavior in the auction itself, but how those spill over into the market structure and the, the broader incentives of market participants. And so, um, you know, a long time ago, I, I, I actually started working on timber auctions when I was an undergraduate at Duke in 1988. Um, and uh, there already you could see in a lot of the descriptive uh, analyses of the timber industry how important market design was for affecting who participated. And so just as an example, they were looking at the difference between um, first price and uh, open ascending auctions. And it turned out that this affected uh, behavior in the auctions, but not according to just the static theory. It affected uh, the incentives to collude, and it also affected the entry of small bidders. And so I worked on a number of papers that showed uh, how, how that played out in models that were uh, basically theoretical models that were then uh, estimated using structural estimation, so data calibrating those theoretical models to look at the impact on welfare. Um, when I went to work on online markets, um, you know, a couple decades after that, um, one of the first things I noticed when I worked on search advertising markets was again that the it was it was easy for people to think about things like you know first price and second price auctions um, in online advertising, but again the really important things for the performance of these markets was who participated um, and and how they behaved. And so the, the rules and changes in the rules would have short-term effects that looked really different from the long-term effects. And sometimes, you, for example, you might introduce a feature that would be um, that looked beneficial in the short run, but if it was used differentially by large, sophisticated advertisers, it might make smaller advertisers um, less profitable and then less likely to participate in the marketplace. Um, so, you know, and then we fast forward from, you know, these simple kinds of auctions to through, you know, online advertising and now the, the really exciting new applications are all in this sort of service economy, gig economy. And we've uh, now are seeing questions about whether um, enabling, you know, small suppliers or sort of independent uh, uh, service providers who are basically like operating very small businesses whether um, these new marketplaces allow them to enter, which is presumably can be really good for welfare in those markets, um, but also we, we have concerns that allowing all these small service providers to enter can hurt quality. And um, you know, Chiara has been working on this from, other, from the perspective of licensing, but broadly, you know, we, if we want to get the benefits out of this sort of new flexible economy, we're going to need to deal with, um, with uh, incentives for quality. And in managing these marketplaces, and I work with a lot of, uh, of different uh, large platforms in practice, one of the most important things you do as a marketplace designer in this service economy is actually try to incentivize people to do what you want them to do. So what is it that you want them to do you know, in, in uh, say, Airbnb or um, Verbo or um, Rover? These are different platforms that I, I work on. Um, you need people to keep their calendar up to date, to respond to their emails, to provide accurate product descriptions, to, to go the extra mile to make the customer happy. And so actually, rather than if you, if you go in and see like what are the problems people are working on, trying to extract a little bit more of the transaction by changing the prices is not what people are mostly worried about. That's not the biggest problem. That's kind of the zero sum part of the problem, but it's, it's not as interesting. What's actually the, the, the focus of most of the investment and research and, and innovation is about trying to, say, use rankings to induce people to provide better quality and to behave uh, in, in better ways in the platform. So that's like the central problem um, faced by all of these people. And that, again, relates back in the online advertising. It was just about the engagement of the advertisers, getting advertisers to write good ad copy, to run experiments, to better target their ads to the right users. Getting that engagement was part of the quality for the user. So this is a theme across all of these different things. 
So I've been doing empirical work to try to understand some of these things, and I've been studying that in news as well as in ride sharing. We're mostly going to talk about ride sharing today. And I'm going to show evidence in ride sharing that these marketplaces and the different institutions they bring in actually are good for quality, um, where in news they actually are generally going to be bad for quality. And there's good economic reasons why it's different in the different circumstances. And as we start to get more nuanced uh, understanding of the different economics, we can avoid kind of painting these things with a big broad brush and instead really um, focus in on which categories we should be concerned about quality and which we shouldn't. Uh, is the equilibrium quality qualitative or quantitative? Um, I'm gonna, oh, the, the empirical papers, it's quantitative. Um, so uh, generally, you know, a key welfare, now starting to zoom in on ride sharing, a key welfare benefit of the gig economy is flexibility. And so a bunch of, of researchers have done empirical papers on Uber and provide, use revealed preference information and structural estimation to show that the drivers really value their flexibility. And they, the way they figure this out is by looking at how drivers respond to variations in per hour pricing, things like surge pricing. So they provide evidence that basically for at least for the, a lot of the marginal drivers that they are very, um, they really value the flexibility to, 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 and that makes sense, and that's really a, a theme of the gig economy. We have underutilized resources. I have two hours between classes. I'm a mom, and I've got to drop my kids off at school and pick up at school. There's a zillion holidays. Um, you know, there's kids get sick, but I can come in and provide um, labor at a time that's convenient for me, and so that's a big benefit. But if we, if we have a lot of ex-ante screening, um, licensing requirements, and so on, we're not going to be able to get that benefit from the, from the gig economy. I should, by the way, I should just highlight that I do understand that overall, you know, life has gotten worse for certain types of drivers that used to live in a different world and their wages have gone down. So I'm not unsympathetic to that. But I'm taking as given that we've moved to a new world and then I'm within that new world um, the benefits side has to do with flexibility, the benefits for the workers. Um, and so marketplaces are basically replacing ex-ante screening and training with ex-post monitoring feedback nudges and ratings. So there's this whole suite of tools that they have to try to get people to do higher quality. And if I just think about the case of, of ride sharing, you can imagine two different theories. One theory is that there's drivers have different abilities. And so screening is going to basically keep out the low ability people, allow in the high ability people, and keep us all safe. The second theory is that like pretty much anybody can drive, um, but there's a lot of incentives here. And you know, if you have no incentive to provide high quality, then you'll you know, jerk around and swerve in and out of traffic and slam on the brakes. And if you do have an incentive, you'll provide a better quality service. And so of course, it's an empirical question, which one is which? And that's what I'm going to try to measure. Um, now, if you, and there's a bunch of differences between, um, say, taxis and Ubers. Uh, generally, marketplaces do more than just you know, evaluate your direct performance. There's also a psychological difference. So, and, and actually, the platforms do a lot to promote that. In fact, that's one way they can induce good behavior on both sides. So the Uber driver like, talks to you. And you have a more, inter there's the expectation of more interaction, where the taxi, there's this barrier, and there's just this idea that you know, you're separated. And when you do an Airbnb or a, or a Verbo, the, the, a lot of the high quality sellers will actually try to establish a personal interaction with you. And there's a good reason they do that, because there's also moral hazard on the rider side of the market or the, or the renter side of the market. Um, people trash people's houses. Um, and you know, I also work with Turo, which does car sharing. People trash people's cars. And so if you remind the consumer that actually there's a human being on the other side of that interaction, they behave better too. So I'm not going to study that part today. I think that would actually be really interesting um, for future research. But these are, I just want to highlight that there's actually a whole bunch of different tools at the disposal of these marketplaces to solve these moral hazard problems. Um, so what I'm going to try to do here is study this empirically with UberX and taxis. And I, and I got this idea a few years ago when I learned about the amazing telemetry that can come out of your mobile phone. So I learned that, and I learned this actually from some startups, there's startups out there that basically take the telemetry from the phone and then provide as a service to fleets a scoring of safety. 
And when I saw how, how incredibly um, accurate and, and informative that was, I immediately realized that this was going to be a very powerful technology for a whole bunch of purposes. And so if you want to think about comparing quality, it's actually pretty hard to compare the quality of you know, a hotel and a Verbo or an Airbnb. It's hard to compare the quality of a rental car to a Turo because there's a lot of differences in those products. But in the case of transportation, it's much more clear. You're trying to get from point A to point B. Um, you basically need the same service. And I can act, through telemetry, I can actually measure the quality of that service in an apples to apples way that's, that's not really feasible in a lot of other marketplaces. So I approached Uber and said, hey, <clears throat> can I actually use your data to do this study um, because I think it's, I think you're actually going to see differences between the Ubers and taxis. Anybody my age who's ridden in taxis doesn't have a lot of doubt about which one is providing me a better service. So I had a strong hypothesis about how this was going to turn out, but I thought it would be really interesting to actually um, quantify that. So um, Uber is is going to be, you know, okay, is going to be providing a service that's different in a bunch of ways. Now, there's a bunch of, when people say safety in Uber, the first thing they think about is safety from driver crime. Now, in the US, despite headlines, this is really a minor issue. It's a minor issue for taxis and Ubers, both. Um, but you know, in developing countries, actually, everybody pretty much understands that the Ubers are actually a lot safer, because often the taxis are in cahoots with the local police, and people, the, the taxis are often kind of part of you know, some sort of organized crime where they kind of hold you up and extort from you and then they don't get prosecuted. So the, the monitoring <clears throat> of and knowing who was your driver and the fact that they actually aren't part of this old cooperative can be more safe. But we're also not going to talk about that in this paper. Yeah, Nicole? What about, like, you know, being hit on? Um, yeah, being, uh, sure. So we're not measuring that here. Do like, you know that that's a small, is that insignificant in that marketplace? Yeah, so I don't know about the, the US. I think that the anecdotal evidence from other countries where the whole problem is larger is that the Ubers and taxis are, again, um, generally better. And I think that's just from a theoretical perspective, that's really clear. Just the accountability is very different. In some sense, if you wanted to be a criminal on Uber or Lyft, you basically are going to be a criminal once. Um, if you're going to be a criminal in a taxi, you know you can potentially sustain that for quite a while. And so, um, but I, I'm not going to try to measure that. Um, and so another, so what I'm going to measure is driver safety, which you could imagine calibrating in terms of probability of accidents. I actually did not have data on accidents, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but actually, even just looking at probability of accidents is not going to exactly capture what consumers want, um, because consumers, like if you didn't want to get in an accident, you would never get in your car. Um, and probably some of you have had the experience of telling your driver that you're late for a plane. Um, so there are, people have preferences about speed, and you don't actually want people to drive at the safety optimal speed. You actually have, might have preferences about, what, about g getting people to drive faster. So we're going to really focus on responsiveness to customer preferences in this paper, but we're also going to be able to say something about safety just from what's known from other sources. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the region of Chicago. This is the region we're analyzing. Um, and the reason we picked Chicago is because in Chicago, the Uber app is used to dispatch taxis. So we're going to get identical telemetry between the Uber X's and the taxis. And that will allow us to compare sort of apples to apples. Now, um, it, just to get started, let's talk about what's the difference between the taxis and the Ubers. They do have different financial incentives. So they have a somewhat higher base fare. But the charges per minute and per mile are roughly two times t higher for taxis and Ubers. So at least the, the relative um, considerations are similar for the two. Um, within UberX, there are quality incentives and nudges. So in, inside UberX, you get a rating, which is the average of your last 500 rides. And you also see the most recent rating. There are ratings-based incentives, which I'll show you in a minute. And there are also safety monitorings and warnings. And we're going to study the rollout of those in an experiment as well. So generally, low ratings and complaints are relatively uncommon. But actually, poor driving and slow driving are among the more common complaints. And I wanted to highlight the slow driving because actually, the speed is the hardest thing to get at empirically here because people's preferences are non-monotonic. Um, and so we, in certain cases, I'm going to break out results by things that include speed and don't include speed.
because our speed results are going to be, well, though we use machine learning to fit the functional form, blah, blah, blah. Because of the non-monotonicities, the, the functional form matters for speed. And so you can think of our results as possibly being less robust um, to speed. So when we look at the ratings, um, in this marketplace, like many marketplaces, basically like everybody gets a five. And that's a problem for trying to use ratings to help improve quality because they're just the rating itself is not that informative. On a particular ride, you're not getting much information out of it. And of course, rides are also not always rated, and the propensity to rate is not random. So the, the, using the rating itself as an outcome to measure quality, while in, somewhat informative or informative on average, is not going to be informative at a very micro level. And this is a problem actually we had in, in experimentation in the search engine as well. You had things like conversion rate or you know, conversions from an ad. So just a consumer click on an ad, go to your website and buy something. Those conversion rates are very, very low. And then not all advertisers shared conversion information. So if you wanted to see whether something you did improved quality of ads and conversion rates, so actually, you could look at it on average if you had a, a large you know, multi-million user experiment. But if you tried to cut it down into this vertical or this type of query, you would very quickly lose statistical power and be unable to, to see any statistically significant results. So the, the rate, and, and this, this scenario is actually really quite common um, across marketplaces, where there's some kind of measure that you, of quality you'd like to have but it's sparse and has other problems um, in terms of being operationalizable for evaluating Wait, results. Susan, can yep. you tips instead of uh, ratings? Um, yes, yeah, so actually in the time we're looking at, we didn't have, the tips were new, so we don't have tips data in here, but you could come back and look at tips as well. And that, that might um, be uh, you know, a, a better follow-on paper. Um, I should say we've been working on this paper for a little while, and we've just uh, gotten it released um, because it, th there's a lot of new data in here. So it was actually quite a bit of effort to get all of this analysis sort of through um, through all the layers of approval. Okay, so um, the uh, so when we look at the incentive systems, so when you go below a 4.6, you get a warning. Below 4.5, you get another warning and you become temporary deactivated at 4.4. Um, then you can go to a quality improvement course, um, and then you would be, if you, if you don't maintain above there, you'll get permanently deactivated. But again, you need, um, to, they look at 25 trips since reactivation. So even though Uber drivers are kind of talk about being afraid of getting kicked off, it's actually really hard to get kicked off of Uber. Um, and they get a lot of chances and warnings before that would happen. And so just to see how many people are in these buckets in the data set we're looking at, um, we actually see a very small percentage of drivers being in the range where, um, where the, these things are going to be operational. So from an incentive perspective, although as an economist it might be nice to say, oh, well, you know, this is a market where incentives, like rating-based incentives, have fixed quality problems. I think it's very hard just from the, even a back of the envelope before you start the analysis to come to that conclusion because um, it's so hard to, to get kicked off. And so we're, what we're going to see is that the, the, Im, the differences will be too large to be explained by that. Yeah. Are these Chicago-specific thresholds? Um, these, are, these are the thresholds that were, that were in operation in Chicago at the time. As, as you well know, in these tech firms, things change all the time. So actually, I don't know what they currently are today. Um, yeah. How did, so taxi drivers also get kicked off? No. No. So that is a difference between taxis and Ubers that they get, they have this incentive system, but they, I would argue that it's only a small percentage are really feeling that incentive at a moment in time. Yeah, Andre? Uh, so in other marketplaces, the demand side is very responsive to ratings. On Uber, I assume it's less, but do you have some metric for, like, if I have a 4.6 rating as a driver, am I more likely to be canceled on? And, like, what's that delta? I do not know how, how those ratings affect um, rider response, but my intuition is it also, it hasn't really been, it's not really exposed to the, to the, ride, the riders because they're generally just taking what's being assigned. Um, now, very recently, there have been new introductions, like now I'm a Diamond Uber member, and so I'm supposedly getting better drivers. And so presumably, that's also providing an incentive for the, for the drivers. 
exactly. So in principle, there are other incentives operating here, but I would argue that they're not, they're not huge. They, they, they wouldn't be responsible for all aspects of behavior. Yep. So you uh, concluded from these numbers that it's very hard to get kicked out, but just these numbers don't necessarily support the conclusion. It could be that incentives are working and people are behaving. Responding to them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it, at a moment in time for a particular ride, most drivers are not worried about these incentives, but it's certainly keeping them from behaving badly all the time. Um, exactly. That's, a, that's a, a good point. So to try to do the back of the envelope, we looked at um, how, many, how many drivers would be at risk of getting, of passing different thresholds, a 4.6 threshold, a 4.5 threshold, and a 4.4 threshold, if the next in trips received a three-star rating. And we saw it's pretty hard to get a three-star rating. And so we just say, OK, if, if, how many drivers would it be that if they got 20 three-star ratings in a row would be at risk of passing the 4.4 threshold? And it's still well below 5%. But if I looked at how many drivers would get their first warning after getting 23 stars in a row, you know, now it's getting closer to 15%. Um, so it's, it's, it's presumably there in their minds, um, but it's not, it's not an immediate threat to get kicked off. So it's, if these, these are operating through, through other channels. It could also be, and we're going to show some evidence that supports this, it could also be partly psychological, just that people like Uber has said 4.6 is bad. I don't want to be near 4.6 because I don't want to be bad, um, but not because I think I'm going to get kicked off if I get to 4.6. OK, so then we do a little bit of um, descriptive analysis. Um, so here are some of the telemetry metrics we look at, being mounted, being handling the phone, hard brakes, hard accelerations. And then we have some speed metrics. So the speed is actually very multidimensional. So every block you go through, the trip is rated in its speed as a percentile of other trips through that same physical block at that same time. So if you, if you go from you know, here to the airport, if you go through you know, 150 blocks, each of those 150 blocks gets a percentile. So we had to try to figure out how to use that very high dimensional data and so one of the things we looked at was the, the, the kind of percentiles of the percentiles, like the low, the 10th uh, percentile of your percentiles and the, say, the, the 90th percentile of your percentiles or the 20th percentile of your percentiles or the 80th percentile of your percentiles. So it's basically saying, like, in, in, in your ride, is there parts of your ride that are much lower than average and are there parts of your ride that are much faster than, than average? And so just as descriptive statistics, we try to decompose each of those metrics into rider effects, trip characteristics, and the residual just to see sort of what's explaining them. One thing, again, with speed, I'll point out that, that trip characteristics explain a relatively high share of the variation for speed, while um, it's, it's less for the other types of metrics. And it's another reason we break out speed, because speed depends a lot on exactly the trip that you're doing. And we're going to try to compare different trips that are they're not the same trip. And so we also might be more sensitive to um, mistakes or specifications we do in, in comparing trip to trip for speed, because it's so important. Um, the trip is so important. We also see, when you actually look at the rating itself, the rider explains um, a, a huge part of the variation in ratings, which is another reason that rate, a rating, a specific rating on a specific trip doesn't tell you that much about the driver. Instead, it tells you about the rider. So at least if you're going to use ratings to actually get, you know, give incentives to drivers, maybe you should be taking out the rider effect first because it's so big. And that would give you a better thing. And so generally, one of the kind of operational things that I feel like comes out of our analysis is that, in general, these platforms should move away from the, the star ratings themselves and be should, should constructing their own metrics that um, help, them, uh, help them do a better job monitoring. And actually, when I give this paper from a, to AI conferences, I actually talk about how exciting this whole technology is from the perspective of worker safety across the economy. Because once you realize that you can, you can look at workers, whether it's cameras on an assembly line, cameras on customer service people, emails with customer service people, and you can label it 
as good or bad, then you can use machine learning to come up with a score for every customer interaction or every worker action and actually use that to try to improve safety and quality across the economy. And I'm actually, once, you, once I wrote this paper, I was like, oh yeah, that's going to happen. And it turns out, yes, it is happening, in fact. And it's going to accelerate over the next couple of years. Um, so then what we do is we, but the safety metrics, of course, have unclear interpretations, complex interaction effects, as well as non-monotonicities. So what we do is we um, build a model that predicts ratings as a function of safety metrics. And we also include um, fixed effects for the trip, for example. Um, and we, so what we're trying to look at, as well as for the driver, and what we're doing is basically trying to say, what is it, if the metrics improved, how much would that improve ratings? And so we want to think about you know, a, being able to compare across trips that if this, holding everything else fixed, if the telemetry was higher in this metric, the, the customer likes it more. Um, so we tried a bunch of different functional forms. We ended up with, a, because there's a fair bit of smoothness, like things are either monotone or par parabolic, we found that a lasso with polynomials did the best um, in terms of fitting the data. These are some, some, just some pictures of the, the predictive model showing that there's interaction effects and non-monotonicities. I don't have time to go into that now. Oops, my slides got a little chopped off here. Um, OK, so thanks. OK. Um, so when we, what we're going to, this, this, these indices, actually, there's a whole statistical theory about it. And it's actually something I've been working on with Raj Chetty, Hito Wimbins, and, and Hyung Song Kang where we are trying to actually develop a good theory of, of creating these indices. And part of the reason we wrote the paper, Raj Chetty needs to do it for his papers about school performance. I needed to do it in search engines. In fact, I introduced a bunch of these kinds of metrics um, when I worked on the search engine. And, it, and it, now it was coming up again in, the, in this Uber paper. And basically, what we're trying to do is create, use intermediate variables that are either better available because they're faster or less missing than the final outcome you care about. So if you care about people's final income after 20 years, test scores might be a prediction of that. Um, but we're not going to wait 20 years to see if class size improves student performance. So we have to use intermediate metrics. The conversion example was the one I worked on in, um, in advertising. And here there's another example where, again, there's problems with the ratings uh, directly. But we have all of these um, telemetry, which basically gives us much more fine-tuned and, and much more variation from trip to trip than the rating itself. Um, so it turns out that. Um, there's two setups where this can be useful. One is that you see the surrogates, um, but you only see the final outcome in, say, part of your data. And that, when we compare U Uber to taxis, that's one way to think about it. In the taxis, there are ratings, but basically nobody really uses the ratings, and the ratings don't mean the same thing for the taxis. So basically, it's as if we see the ratings for the Uber drivers, but we don't see them reliably for the taxis. So we're going to build the model mapping the surrogates, the telemetry, to the ratings in the Uber data. And then, uh, but then we see the same telemetry, the same surrogates, in both the taxis and the Ubers. And so we create a score that can be compared apples to apples. The second thing we have is in, when we analyze an experiment that I'll show you, we actually do see the surrogates and the ratings in this experiment, because the experiment was just done on Uber drivers. But it turns out there's still a statistical efficiency gain from using the intermediate metrics. And the reason for that is that if under the assumption that all of the impact of, of the experiment is captured by the surrogates and that the treatment doesn't, direct, doesn't change the relationship between the telemetry and the ratings, then pooling the data across treatment and control to estimate the relationship between the surrogates and the final outcome gives us a more efficient estimate of the final outcome relationship, and that increases power. And again, this is something that we saw in practice when I did this um, in the search engine. And so in our, in our paper, we developed that theory. So that's going to justify what we do. And so basically here, we can have some covariates x. This is like trip characteristics. S, the surrogates, are the telemetry. And we're going to have some kind of treatment that affects the surrogates. And what we're, gonna, we're really only going to be interested in the, these treatments, like UberX versus taxi or an experiment. We're only interested in, in their, the effects that go through the telemetry. So the subject of the paper is the quality of the ride is measured by telemetry. 
but rescaled as an index of customer satisfaction. So let me um, keep going here. So here, now I have these scores, and I'm going to have a full score that includes all the telemetry, a speed score that just looks at the speed metrics, and then a score without speed that throws away the speed metrics for the reasons I talked about before. We use three different estimators to compare UberX versus taxis. Um, the, the, the first is a matching estimator, and it turns out it just doesn't matter which one we use. The first, but the matching estimator is the easiest to interpret, so we can think somebody's standing on the corner, and they're either going to call an UberX or an Uber Taxi, and I want to understand how much safer is their ride going to be if they call an UberX. So to do that, we take the starting point, the ending point, and the hour block of the week, and for every Uber Taxi ride, we find the closest UberX ride. Um, and then we throw them away if we don't have a good match. And so that's what we're left with. And here we basically have about 80,000 Uber X, I mean, Uber taxi trips that can be matched with Uber X. Now we have many more Uber X trips, so we have millions. But in fact, the estimates are going to be similar when we use, say, fixed effects for the, um, for the trip, partly because essentially for the, for the, the, tri the fixed effects are so small that in the, in the cells that don't have both an Uber X and an Uber taxi ride, those are basically just discarded. So it gets back to basically the same thing, whether we do the fixed effects or the matching. Um, okay, and so basically what we find is that the Uber Xs are, are substantially um, better according to all of these scores than the Uber taxis. And partly because we have, we have a lot of data, we get precise estimates. And the metrics are scaled um, in terms of star ratings, star ratings and the, the standard deviations are about um, 0 0.02, uh, 0 0.01 to 0.02. Then we go to look at um, heterogeneity. So we looked at a couple of different types of, of rides, off-peak rides, morning rush, and, uh, and, and afternoon rush. And we, um, we find some differences uh, that the, the gaps between the Uber and the taxi are actually, say, smaller in the morning rush hour. And that might be when the people are trying to get to work and they're asking their Uber drivers to hurry, in which case the Ubers, the, the taxis kind of race around all the time is one way to think about it. The Uber drivers can be relaxed, but if you ask them to speed up and to kind of provide a more aggressive ride to get you to work on time, or to get to the airport, things like that, then they will close the gap and drive in a more aggressive way. Um, then we try to, to try to unpack a little bit of why this is going on. So we look at the driver responsiveness to their last rating. Now, um, in general, there's going to be lots of things that induce serial correlation among the ratings. And so what we do is we use an instrumental variables approach where we instrument for the last rating a driver got with the ratings that other drivers got in that same hour of the year. So right now, this particular hour of the year, it's raining and everybody's dinging their Uber drivers, um, then you know, this particular Uber driver is more likely to have gotten a bad rating. And so that's the, that's the natural experiment we're saying. If you were driving in an hour where everybody was getting bad ratings, how do you change your driving behavior in the next ride? And so what we find is that um, the, uh, the, if your last rating was bad, your next rating is, is good. And so the drivers sort of turn things around, like that, seeing that, oh my gosh, I just got a bad ride, they kind of jump right back into gear and they try to do things that will make the next driver, the next rider happy, whether it's offering them gum, giving them a, a power cord, whatever it is. Yes? They see the last rating. Yes, exactly. They see two things, the last 500 and the last one. So they would see that. Now, when we go to the, to the safety, though, we basically get pretty precisely estimated zeros. So they're not, so, and I think this is probably accurate, actually. The drivers are perceiving that the best way to get their ratings up in the next ride is to, you know, tell them, please give me a five, give them gum, smile, be nice. But actually, driving a little bit more safely is probably not going to have a huge impact on your star rating. And so they're not really adjusting in that way. So that they may overall understand that, um, that driving well helps them get good ratings, but it's not, the, it's not the most actionable way to kind of get a quick fix back to your rating. And I think this sort of also just suggests that um, there's a little bit of behavioral thing here, that they may just be forgetting to smile and be nice. Um, and so just getting reminded is kind of getting them to kick in uh, their, their behavior. 
Um, okay. So then we look more at this warnings thing. So we look at the whole warning system. This is a little bit less well identified, but we look at um, how do people respond when they get a warning, but also how do they respond when the warnings get removed? So if they bring their rating back up, they get another message that says, hey, your warning has expired, you're back in good graces. And so it turns out that whether they're getting a warning that says you're doing badly or they're getting a message that says that their warning has expired, in both cases, they Im improve their behavior, which is, again, sort of consistent with more of a behavioral assumption of being reminded to, to do a good job rather than a pure incentive. That, that's easy to arrange in the app itself, right? Yeah. You can say it's smile now. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, exactly. So that suggests that they should be doing more kind of coaching. And I think this is actually, from an AI perspective, actually, this is really the promise of this technology is that if you can actually just get people to do a good job, of course, at some point people stop paying attention. But if you manage the behavioral uh, of, uh, approach with people, that's a very cheap way. And it can actually make everybody feel better as well. Well, right now, if you give a rating, you might feel really guilty giving a three-star rating. So the consumer doesn't like giving the ratings. It's very noisy for the drivers. So the rating itself is sort of may not be the best way to tell people. But if you instead just tell them, here's a way to improve, that might be more powerful. And that basically leads us into the ex randomized experiment. So we, we analyze an experiment to provide safety information to drivers. And basically, the way this was implemented, it was a tab in the driver app that so showed various safety metrics to the drivers. Then there were nudges to get them to look at the tab. But the safety information was not explicitly used in the incentive. So in particular, when they would see this, they would see, learn about your driving. This is automatically generated. And it's just for you. So it's not going to be shown to anybody else. That's just basically saying this just for you messaging is that it doesn't affect your account status in any way. Okay? So then this is what the information would look like. It can, and I'm sorry, it's a little blurry here, but you can see that these drivers were getting these, this driver here was getting orange exclamation marks, which means their hard brakes and hard accelerations were below average. And so that's the kind of feedback that they would be getting. Now, of course, we all know that we're all above average, right? Um, so you know, it, it would be big news to any of us to get an orange exclamation mark that says that we uh, do too much swerving. Um, and anybody who's ever argued with someone, uh, maybe their spouse or someone else, about whether they're braking too hard will be familiar with the idea that everyone thinks they're above average. Um, so this is, what, this is what, we, what we got. And then just analyzing this experiment in Chicago, um, we have about 24,000 drivers in the control group and, and, and 36,000 drivers in the treatment group. Um, now, this, this experiment was actually run more broadly, but we're analyzing it in Chicago because that's where we've really delved in. But we have some power problems. So the experiment's a little bit underpowered for our purposes, but we, we, are, we had the data set from Chicago, and so that's what we analyzed. So just to be clear why the experiment's a little bit underpowered here. So what we look at now, now this experiment's a little bit tricky because it's the, you're going to be assigned this at the driver level. Some drivers will never look at the tab. And so they're going to have a treatment effect of zero. So we're going to, the first thing we can do is analyze this as an intent to treat analysis, where you've been given access to the information, but you may not comply with reading the information. And then we also do a, a sort of a treatment on the treated analysis, where we try to instrument for whether you actually looked at the app by, with your assignment. And that's basically just going to inflate the estimates, because we can observe whether you actually looked at the app or not. And so what we see basically is that the results are a little noisy, um, but they are, uh, you know, generally we're seeing, especially in this, um, the treatment, the, the instrumental variables analysis, positive and statistically significant impact on your safety scores from interaction with the app. Um, but then when we break this out more finely, we look at whether you're in the bottom 10th percentile before the experiment starts as a pretreatment variable. And we, because this is basically just going to be giving you exclamation marks, the theory would be that this, should, this experiment should really, really have an effect on people who were driving badly. And so just taking a cut here, we take the people who were in the bottom 10th percentile on these, on these scores before the experiment started, and we find that that's where all the treatment effects are coming from. Um, and those, so the people who got the orange exclamation points, basically, the kind of people who were likely to get orange exclamation points were impacted by this. So um, to, to summarize, we find that UberX is significantly higher quality than taxis in terms of safety metrics. Um, while the incentives surely play a role, 
the whole body of evidence suggests that, that incentives are not the only thing going on, and actually these informational nudges are playing an important role. Um, we also see that the UberX drivers are, drive, are, are more responsive to passenger preferences than taxis. So we'd say the myth that modern marketplaces provide lower quality at a lower cost is rejected in the data. Monitoring, rating, reviews, and nudges can compensate um, for the reduced screening and hiring. Um, and I think, but just again, the, the big takeaway I have actually beyond this paper is that we should be seeing, we, we should expect to see over the next five years, less emphasis on this costly activity of making a consumer you know, ding a driver, which feels bad to everybody, and more emphasis on telemetry and direct measurement of behavior um, and that, that's more reliable, has better statistical properties, um, and, and then can also um, you know, be, be used to help get the, the service providers to improve just by their own intrinsic motivation um, rather than other, other properties. Okay, so I'll stop there. So lots of questions along the way. Any, any more questions or comments? So, yeah. so the stories are public, but the information about these details is not, right? They only yeah. know it themselves. Exactly. Um, which, which is a difference in the treatment that is completely different in terms of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivations. So that, that also, have you thought about, um, you know, would you make it public or not? Would you recommend that, that this more precise information is made public, or you think part of the treatment is that it's really triggering intrinsic motivation. Yeah, so the question is like, should we be making these, these things public? And so there's probably the, the driving thing in practice is gonna be how it makes the workers feel. Um, because that, if there's a huge disutility, you know, then you have to account for that in the overall welfare of the platform. And so actually I had a, a PhD student, John Kolstad, who's here at Berkeley, more than 10 years ago wrote his PhD thesis about providing information about quality privately to doctors. And the doctors and the hospitals, of course, violently oppose any kind of scorecarding. Um, and so if you take that as a political reality, it turns out that you could get the doctors to do better just by telling them that their complication rates were high. So I think in a political setting and a, a personal setting where people do feel disutility about these things, it, it's interesting that you can get a lot of the bang for the buck just out of telling them. Um, whether you want to incorporate it in a broader score, I think it's, it, can, it could be hard for consumers to understand, and I think that is com the communication of these things in a world where people d aren't really spending a lot of time to understand the way the whole system works can be tricky as well. So my guess is that the way this, it, balancing all considerations, given that you can get a lot of the way there without making it public, that's probably going to be the way it plays out in practice. It's just that this proxy is public, like the stars, which is rude and wrong and, you know, is public, and then the more concrete, which could be more useful, is not. So yeah, so exactly. So what you, what, what you could imagine doing, and this would require a lot of study by the platforms, it would be a major change, is to stop showing the stars and to show something else, which is just some sort of rating, some crude rating, that you, and then they don't tell you exactly what it is um, because they're going to be changing it all the time and things like that. So... I, I agree that this, this I, I'm definitely with you that like the star rating is gonna decline. Yeah, Kiara? This is probably a general Oh yeah, oh, so yeah. offline, yeah, yeah. yeah, we're running over. Okay, Thanks. so we don't wanna cut into the break anymore. So we have a break until 11, and then we'll resume to hear from uh, Itai Aslagi and Kiara Farunato somewhere around. Okay? Thank you.